In today's 3D printer market, Core XY is the new Cartesian, Clipper is the new Marlin, and you get a lot more machine for your money. The Kingroon KLP1 is the modern day Ender 3. It has an entry level price point with an advanced feature set. It's running an unlocked version of Clipper with vanilla Clipper screen on the touch LCD. A refreshing change from other mass market Clipper printers with watered down firmware and proprietary UIs. In this video, we'll be doing a deep dive into the KLP1. I'll tell you what I like, what I don't, and what niche it fills in today's crowded 3D printer market. Thanks for joining us. Let's get started. The KLP1 is a fully enclosed printer with Core XY kinematics. It has 210 millimeters of build volume on all axes. Linear rails are used for motion on X and Y. The Z axis is lead screw driven with a two to one gear reduction for increased torque. The build platform is cantilevered and rides on two half inch smooth rods. Underneath, we can see a PCB style heater, which has a maximum temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. The bed itself is an eighth of an inch slab of aluminum with a magnetic sticker on top and is spring loaded with eight points of adjustment. It's factory leveled, so we shouldn't need to touch them. Instead, we have an inductive probe for auto bed leveling. The build surface is spring steel with dual sided textured PEI. The interface to the printer is a 3.5 inch resistive touchscreen running clipper screen. Alternatively, the printer can be controlled remotely via the fluid web interface using the onboard Wi-Fi module. If you prefer to go the wired route, there's also an RJ45 Ethernet port. Alongside it are a USB 3.0 port and two USB 2.0 ports. There's no onboard camera, but we can easily connect a USB webcam for remote monitoring. Under the hood, we have a 300 watt, 24 volt power supply. The brains of the operation is a custom control board, the Kingroon KP Cheetah version 2.2. It has a 32-bit MCU with TMC2209 silent stepper drivers, a buzzer for playing chimes, and a handful of unused ports that could be used for expansion. A downstream daughter board on the tool head is connected to the main board via CAN bus. This board has an RP2040 MCU, the same chip found on a Raspberry Pi Pico, which is used to handle the clipper computations. Additionally, we have an onboard ADXL345 accelerometer for input shaping. The hot end features a 0.4 mm hardened steel nozzle and a 360 degrees ceramic heater, which is capable of reaching 300 degrees C. A 3010 axial fan cools the heatsink, while a 5015 radial fan provides part cooling. The extruder is a dual gear direct drive with a 9.5 to 1 gear ratio powered by a 36 mm pancake stepper motor. Filament is fed to the extruder from the back of the printer through a runout sensor to the printhead in a reverse Bowden configuration. So that's the hardware. Setup is straightforward. Remove a few screws as indicated by the arrows, then install the acrylic panels on the sides, front, and top. The pre-flight commissioning process is what impressed me most about this printer. The user manual illustrates how to perform each step both on the LCD and through the web interface. It takes you step by step through bed leveling, setting the Z offset, conducting input shaping for resonance compensation, loading filament, and finally performing pressure advanced calibration. This is the easiest, most beginner friendly setup process I've ever seen. It takes the complexity of Clipper and distills it down to a few easy to follow steps. Most other commissioning guides for Clipper based printers stop short of pressure advanced calibration but the KLP1 includes pre-sliced G-code for this step. Also supplied is G-code for a violent Benchy, which prints in just 19 minutes. The results were excellent. We were off to a good start. The KLP1 is supplied with machine profiles for Cura, Prusa Slicer, and Orca Slicer. Following the provided instructions, I imported the profiles to Orca Slicer and sliced my first model, the Clockspring Torture Toaster. The print was looking good until the nozzle caught one of the overhang test pieces and broke it off. After that, it started to go downhill fast, so I cancelled the print. The next test was the Maker's Muse Clearance Castle. This is the first time I've printed this, so it took me a while to realize that the left tower is a puzzle and not just an ordinary tolerance test. But the print quality was great, and I eventually was able to remove both the tower and the door. For test 3, I tried the Maker's Muse Tolerance Gauge. The pieces moved easily down to 0.3 millimeters of clearance. I noticed that there was some elephant's foot on the first layer that prevented the other two pieces from moving. So I enabled elephant's foot compensation in the slicer in addition to running flow calibration using the built-in tool in Orca Slicer. With the flow calibrated, I ran the test again. 
The first layer was improved, but otherwise the result was the same. It seems that the dimensional accuracy suffers somewhat at these high speeds. At this point, I decided to set up a camera for remote monitoring. It was as easy as plugging it in and adding a webcam in the web interface. I then printed an articulated octopus and a droopy vase, both of which turned out great. For my final PLA test, I printed this Loki bust by Wexter at 0.16mm layer height. Besides a rough spot under the chin, where support should have been added, the result was very clean, with excellent detail reproduction and minimal surface artifacts. Next up was PETG. I ran a temperature tower first. Every layer looked good, so I picked the highest temperature for the best layer bonding. I then printed this portable cable organizer. The quality was great. The print in place hinge functioned as intended, as did the winding mechanism. Next was a pole copter toy. No problems with bed adhesion, even with the smaller gears. There were a few surface artifacts, but that's not uncommon when printing glossy filaments at high speeds. Unfortunately, the fit was too tight to assemble it properly. I didn't do full calibration before printing, so we'll call that user error. The KLP1 is only supplied with a PLA profile. Normally, we'd at least have access to some generic filament profiles, but the way the machine profile was set up, the filament dependencies weren't inherited, so we'll have to make them from scratch. After my PTG printing, I noticed that the fan shroud had warped from the higher bed temperature. I'll never understand why printer manufacturers ship ABS-capable printers with PLA fan shrouds. Fortunately, the fan shroud STL was available online. This was the perfect excuse to test the KLP1's ABS printing capabilities. I did the basic configuration of temperatures and set the fan speed to zero before sending the print. The result was poor, showing evidence of overheating. For the second attempt, I decreased the print speed and increased the fan speed. The result was much better. I took a few minutes to install the new shroud, then tried another ABS print. This time it was the Devil Burner print head cover for the Creality K1. I had previously printed this on my Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon, so this would be a perfect comparison. Overall, the results looked great. Comparing it side by side with the print from the X1C, the surface over supports looked better on the KLP1. However, there were more surface artifacts on the sidewalls, with the print quality overall looking better on the X1C. Lastly, I tried TPU. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it to feed through the filament sensor, so I had to bypass it. Again, I had to make the profile from scratch. I borrowed the values from the generic TPU profile for the Bamboo X1C, then sent a test print. This flexible bracelet printed fine, with no tangling in the extruder. It adhered a little too well to the PEI, and was a bit stringy due to the lack of drying, but overall, another successful print. So let's summarize. The KLP1 gave good print results with all of the materials I tested. I didn't hit the limit of flow rate or part cooling, despite the high print speeds. The overhangs were crisp, and there was no evidence of under extrusion on any of my prints. Dimensional accuracy did seem to suffer, however, with poor results on the tolerance test. The KLP1 is a nice little printer, but it's not perfect. These are my complaints. Filament feeding is somewhat inconvenient, with the filament often getting stuck on the way to the tool head. On one occasion, it managed to escape the drive gears entirely, requiring disassembly to recover it. This bolt holder location is poorly thought out, being placed too close to the top of the machine. This results in the top door resting on the flange of the spool when open, which would cause filament feeding issues. The top could easily be propped up in order to avoid this, but I'd rather the spool holder just be positioned lower. The touchscreen is nice, but it's small, requiring a stylus to operate. At first, I thought my screen was broken because I couldn't use the scroll bar, but it turns out that you can scroll by dragging in the middle of the screen. It was also not in English when I first received it. After some poking around, I found a way to change the language from within the web interface. The build quality is solid overall. However, I did notice that either the frame or the panels, or maybe both, were slightly out of square. They didn't quite line up, leaving some unsightly gaps that will allow heat to escape. I also had some issues getting the door installed as a result. Personally, I would have preferred if the panels were clear. The tinted panels make it difficult to see the print without opening the door or lifting the top. Given how small the build chamber is, there's really no space to put a camera inside. If the panels were clear, the camera could be positioned outside and still have good visibility. Instead, I had to prop the top panel open and place the camera on top. This is fine for PLA printing, but wouldn't be an option for ABS. It's also a little strange how the LCD is inside the printer when the door is closed. I believe this is because earlier versions of this printer didn't come with a screen. Back on the positive side of things, the illuminated nameplate adds some stylistic flair, 
The firmware comes pre-configured with cancel object and has some useful macros pre-populated. The update manager section of Moonraker was all disabled by default. This is to prevent an upgrade from bricking the machine, but won't allow you to keep up to date with the latest releases of Clipper. Interestingly, Kingrun supplies the printer with an SD-EMMC adapter, which is required to flash the firmware to the mainboard. Other Clipper-based printers like the Chidi X3 series aren't supplied with this, so if you ever brick the printer, you'll need to buy the adapter in order to recover it. This is a nice touch by Kingrun in supplying it. The steps for such things are nicely documented on the manufacturer's website and GitHub page, making it more accessible for beginners. There's also a nice library of spare parts, should you ever need them. All in all, the Kingrun KLP1 is a heavy hitter. There's not much to complain about, especially at this price point. For beginners that are just getting into 3D printing, the KLP1 is a great entry-level option. It provides a nice platform for learning without diluting the experience or capping its potential. It would also be a fantastic farm printer for those that are looking to scale their operation in a cost-effective manner without compromising on performance. If you decide you'd like to pick one up, please consider using my affiliate link in the description down below. Also, leave a comment and let me know what you think of this printer. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more content. My name's Taylor, this is YGK3D, and until next time, happy 3D printing.